It's really good being here. I was a little surprised when uh, uh, Murphy and Andrew asked me to come up and uh, do this talk because I'm not a arborist or a botanist or anything like that. I'm a folklorist and I study tradition. And I'm going to talk to you today for just a little bit about oak rod baskets. White oak was used commonly throughout the, the upland south and southeastern part of the United States to make white oak baskets, but almost all of those traditions are kind of flat split baskets that, uh, that they made. Uh, there was a very distinctive style of basket that is pretty much only found in North America, Eastern North America, in a handful of pockets uh, called oak rod baskets. And I'm going to focus my talk on this particular style of baskets and kind of the cultural history behind that, uh, what, uh, where it came from, uh, how they were used, uh, and what happened to this tradition. Well, I became interested in this topic about 15 years ago when my grandmother uh, was going through some old photographs and some family possessions, and she gave me a basket and a photograph. This photograph is of my uh, great-great-grandmother uh, in south-central Indiana, and she's carrying this basket, and I said, oh, I love this photograph, and my grandmother gave it to me, and she goes, oh, and I've got the basket, too, and she went down to the basement, and she grabbed this basket, and she brought it up to me, uh, and I looked at it, and at first I thought it was a willow basket, and then I started looking at it, and it's like, no, this isn't willow because it doesn't have any of the, the nodules on it and it's not the small pieces. These are like eight foot lengths that make this, this basket style. And I realized that it was white oak. And so then I began my search for trying to understand this kind of forgotten history of oak rod baskets in southern Indiana. And I, went, I discovered that in Brown County, Indiana, where I live, uh, that this was a very common style uh, of basket that was brought there in the 1840s by a family named Hovis from Pennsylvania, Union County, Pennsylvania, where is where it's uh, primarily from, uh, originally from, perhaps. And uh, I should say, Brown County, Indiana is about 300 miles southeast of here. So I began looking at uh, historic photographs to try to figure out uh, where these baskets were from. I saw that my great-great-grandmother used them to maybe feed the chickens or to gather eggs. Uh, you can see a, a couple of these oak rod baskets uh, being used in southern Brown County. Uh, about 1900, I figure, is when this photograph was taken. What do you think they're doing? Gathering hickory nuts, uh, definitely to make some pies or to eat or something like that. Uh, so this is uh, um, uh, a photo from about 1900. By the 1920s, uh, you're still finding these baskets uh, being made and sold and used there uh, for people uh, gathering corn, storing corn, uh, and those types of things. You can also see it's kind of cropped out of this picture. There's also a flat woven oak basket on the other side, but here's the, here's the white oak basket here. Uh, but these baskets were starting to be on their way out, uh, even by this time. You can see that there were uh, there was some flower sacks that were there. I found photographs where if you look real closely, you can see tucked underneath the table at this family reunion, are some oak rod baskets where people gathered, uh, put together their food, and they took it uh, to their Sunday go to meet and uh, uh, dinner on the grounds. Uh, and so it became really interesting in the fact that these aren't just artifacts, they're not just made things, but they're things that people used in everyday life. But that began to, to change. What were the forces that brought this about? Uh, you can see a nice white oak basket, uh, oak rod basket right here in the front. You can see a wooden crate. You know, things started to be shipped in. Uh, maybe they started using crates instead. But the real death nail for oak rod baskets were the infamous bucket. Uh, you can get metal buckets, plastic buckets. These things are very hard to make. They're very laborious, uh, laborious and they're, they're, they're beautiful. Uh, but the metal buckets, plastic buckets, uh, pretty much rendered them uh, obsolete, at least for agricultural and domestic purposes, you might say, for 
no longer necessarily useful for gathering your, uh, carrying your groceries home or for uh, gathering oh, uh, uh, corn or something like that. Um, but people continued to make them. Here's uh, the technique. You can see a basket woven right here. The process is, is they would split out the oak and they would pull them through these metal dies like this to render them round. And I'll show some more up close pictures. As I said, the tradition was brought in the 1840s by um, a man by the name of Henry Hovis. This is his son, Henry W. Hovis. And he continued to make baskets throughout his life. He died in a, the poorhouse in Brown County at the age of 93 years old. And pretty much all throughout his life, if you read the census records, he was a basket maker. That was his craft that he did in the local community. And he taught uh, two of his nephews uh, to make uh, baskets. Uh, Josie Bohall, in fact, locally in Brown County, these baskets are still called Bohall baskets, uh, even though there are no Bohalls around that remember how to make these baskets anymore. And John Bohall. Uh, John Bohall uh, uh, made quite a few baskets. You can see how, them just stacked up, and he'd make baskets all winter long in order to, uh, uh, to make this. Now this is a real interesting photograph from a cultural perspective. If you look at this, you have everything that you need to make a white oak basket there. But, and he's looking like he's making a white oak basket there. But that basket's already made. It's finished. The last thing you do is you wrap the handle and you wouldn't have the finished product and the splits and the oak right there together, those are all separate processes. So the photographers had him drag all this stuff into his workspace so he can make a nice framed picture. Uh, this picture became something that was sold in postcards and prints uh, and became very popular. In fact, oak rod baskets, as they became obsolete as, as uh, agricultural and domestic items, became tourist crafts. Uh, and really had a whole second life, a very prolific second life uh, in the years right before and after uh, World War II uh, for people uh, who were concerned about modernity. They were uh, uh, not sure about all these changes that were happening around them. And so this is Ada Schultz and Grandma Barnes there with her. Ada Schultz was a famous uh, uh, landscape impressionist uh, from southern Indiana. Um, and she was part of the Brown County Art Colony. You can see there she's got her oak rod basket on her arm that she's carrying there. So there are all of these urban elites that became very fascinated with rural life and especially these artifacts and these items that were associated with the past that they wanted to uh, they wanted to revive and they wanted to keep and they wanted to hold on to certain aspects of um, the past. And so you have little tourist shops popping up in Brown County. You can see uh, the rustic inn there, just by the name, you can tell it's not your normal little diner that you might have. The rustic inn, you've got the information bureau. And out front, you've got bit hickory chairs who are made nearby. And then you have a variety of shapes and sizes of oak rod baskets that are for sale. But... These baskets, were, as I said, were very time consuming and very hard to make. Access as, uh, as uh, state forests and parkland uh, sprung up in Brown County. Access to the, to the cultural commons, the forest where you could actually get the trees uh, became limited. Uh, and you start seeing something very distinctive happen. There are oak rod baskets here, but then there's also these type of baskets, that's a flat wound basket. There's also willow baskets that are being brought in. And so baskets are start to be imported from other places. In fact, there were so many of them being brought in from Cannon County, Tennessee. <laughs> this is about 1930 uh, that, uh, uh, that 
really became very difficult for the oak rod basket makers to make a good living doing this. The baskets in Indiana, in this part of Indiana, were made primarily by men. The men went and got uh, wage, uh, day labor jobs. The women stayed at home with family, uh, but this became a domestic craft that they could do uh, while they took care of the family and get the kids involved with it as well. To this day, uh, Cannon County, Tennessee, and parts of uh, the 31W area of uh, Kentucky uh, are known for making this style of basketry. Uh, very fancy baskets, very polished, uh, not like the agricultural uh, rough baskets that the, the men were making in southern Indiana. Nevertheless, there were a few people who continued uh, to make baskets. Uh, I don't know why their neighbors needed them. Usually they were older men. When they reached retirement age, they would go back to some of these crafts that were associated with their youth, and they started making, uh, uh, making them again. This is George Bohall, uh, and he's remembered uh, making baskets for all of, his, all of his family and neighbors. This is Bruce Hovitz. <laughs> who I believe was probably one of the last, if not the last, traditional basket maker in southern Indiana that made these oak rod baskets. Uh, Bruce is the grandson of Henry Hovis, who brought the basket tradition to Brown County in 1840. And Bruce actually passed away in 1991 and made baskets through the 1980s, as far as I can tell. He'd start by felling a second growth white oak tree. He'd quarter it with a splitting wedge and maul. Then he would split it down with a knife uh, into smaller pieces. Once he got them small enough, he would pull them through these metal dies, some of which had belonged to his grandfather that he had brought from Pennsylvania with him. And he continued to, to use those same tools um, uh, throughout the time. Then he'd go down to the creek He'd throw these things into the creek and soak them. He'd soak them so he could make these, these uh, uh, make them pliable and easy to use. Also, when he'd pull them through the pulling uh, the the rod irons, uh, it would make them uh, burnish them a little bit better, make them smoother. He'd make a plus type shape. He'd start weaving in and out. He'd make the bottom. Uh, start adding in weavers to form the sides. He'd weave a, a decorative edge around the bottom of it, pull it up to, to get the basic shape of the basket, and then he would set into weaving. Over one, under two, over one, under two, and he'd repeat that over and over again. And he uh, would fin finish a basket like that. Well, as he made for many of the shops uh, in Brown County, uh, but as the people started selling more contemporary tourist crafts and didn't want these old baskets anymore, he'd go farther and farther afield, and he'd sold several of his baskets uh, in a little shop in Danville, Indiana, that uh, specialized in baskets from all over, uh, all over the world, actually. And so they had some local things. I, I love the sign, lady, make that man stop and let you look at 6,000 baskets. So... A sign of the times, I guess. But John Bohall, talked about John Bohall that had all the stuff laying around his feet there. He also um, taught another man, a man by the name of um, Edward Morgan. And Edward Morgan taught his son, right here, Reuben Morgan. Everyone called him Rube. And during the Depression, Rube and Edward made baskets uh, and traveled throughout uh, southern Indiana and southern Illinois uh, to hardware stores selling their baskets. And then when Rube retired, he started making baskets again. Uh, and uh, he also was one of the last, but maybe not the last basket maker. Probably the last basket maker is Claude Morgan. Claude's his son. And Claude made one white oak basket just so he could say he, he did. And he says, I don't want to show it to you because it's awfully lopsided and, and crooked and everything. 
And I said, tried to ask him, I said, well, do you have any idea where all these baskets are? And he says, oh, most of them are probably gone now. And I said, well, what types of baskets? He said, oh, all types of baskets. And, and I started asking him about where he made them. And he says, well, we don't own the property anymore, but there's an old shed over there where uh, my dad used to do it. So we hopped in his truck. We drove over to the shed. And uh, on the wall of the shed... Now, he's been gone 25 years, but on the uh, walls and door jams and the boards in the shed are the recipes for all the different baskets that he made. And the person that lives in the house uh, now says, well, we were getting ready to paint and, and board all of that up. But if I wanted to know how to make a, a paper plate holder, I know what size splits now to have, or if I wanted a laundry basket, or if I wanted uh, uh, any type of different basket that he had, he'd figure it out and then he'd write the recipe on the wall. Uh, and it's just amazing that that uh, traditional knowledge of how to use white oak is, uh, was almost lost. My, uh, as I said at the beginning, I, I was really interested in coming and talking to this because most of the time I go to arts conferences, I go to historical societies and libraries, and I go to folklore conferences. I just got in from Long Beach, California, where I was presenting uh, this last weekend. And uh, I wanted to come here because it seems to me like there needs to be this real connection between uh, natural resources and cultural resources, and understanding the traditional ways in which materials have been used and have changed over time. Uh, and try to preserve uh, the traditional knowledge that's passed down from generation to generation that's associated uh, with these natural, uh, natural things like white oak in southern Indiana.